Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today is Small Engines Q&A video number 108. And thanks for tuning in today. And I want to thank everybody for their feedback for the video I posted a little while ago on what I'm working on today. I'm going to keep making a lot of those videos because it's easy for me to make them. And I know a lot of people like to see what I'm doing in the shop. So again, I appreciate all your comments on that video. And before I get started, I just want to welcome all my new subscribers. In my first question today, a YouTuber asked me, what do you do when you get a pressure washer pump that's defective? Do you bother rebuilding the pump or do you just replace it? Well, all I do is just replace the pump because I've had them repaired before just to fail a little while down the road. And then people may think you did a bad job. So it's just easier to replace the pump. Another reason is that sometimes it's hard to get parts for the pump or you have to wait a long time. And sometimes the parts end up costing a lot of money and it's not even worth fixing the pump at that point. So I just replace the pump because then I know that the complete pump is in good working condition and that all the parts in it are good. The other day I got a question from a YouTuber asking me, why does the brake band on my chainsaw brake not retract? It just stays extended. Now I'll just show you what I mean by brake band. This is the brake band in the brake of your chainsaw. When it's extended, the brake is not on. You can use your saw, the chain will turn. And when the brake is on, by pushing it, the band is retracted, it's smaller. So this is not the problem the YouTuber is having. His problem is that it's always expanded. So I'll put the brake off. It will expand the band back, just like this. So his band is just staying extended. Now he's wondering what's causing that. It could be that there's something here in the linkages that's broken. It could also be that the band is broken itself, maybe inside here or somewhere where you cannot visibly see it right away. I've seen that happen before. By the way, the band is not an expensive part, so don't worry about that. It's just when you go to put it in, you wanna make sure that everything's hooked up the way it should be or else it's not gonna work. So the bottom line is make sure that the band is not broken anywhere at all, including inside over here, and make sure that the parts are hooked up correctly. Now I had a guy come in my shop the other day and he said that the brake band on his chainsaw breaks a lot. He's wondering what's causing that. Well, what could be causing that, which I think it is in his case, is that he's using the brake unnecessarily. So he's not using it for emergencies, he's just using it to stop the chain from turning whenever he goes to turn the chainsaw off. So that's gonna put a lot of wear and tear on your band and it will break prematurely. These bands are really designed to be used for emergencies or to prevent an injury. They're not made to be used every day like the on-off switch on your chainsaw. So basically just use it to be safe or to prevent an injury. You do not need to use it all the time like the on-off switch on your chainsaw. Another question I often get from YouTubers is what's a good starting point for the setting screws on my two cycle carburetor, for example, on a grass trimmer or a chainsaw. Well, what I like to do is start the screws at approximately one and a half turns out to two turns out, then at least I know it's gonna start. It may not be set correctly, but at least you can get the motor going so that you can adjust it properly. And here's a small two cycle carburetor with diaphragms in it. This is the type of carburetor I'm talking about. So these are the two screws here. I would turn approximately one and a half turns out to two turns and then adjust it from there. So here's the H screw, the high speed screw, and the low speed screw on the left. It's a good starting point for the screws. Your unit will still start, and it will give you a chance to set the carburetor properly from there. You may have to turn in the screws more than likely to get a proper setting. Now another question I often get is in regards to this little scooter here. It's a generic scooter made in China. I'm not quite sure of the brand or make. But the question I often get is, where can you get parts for these scooters? Well, the best place I've found to get parts for these scooters is on eBay. Even I find sometimes it's hard to get all the parts on eBay, like sprockets and different parts like that. So if anybody's watching today that knows exactly where to get all the parts for the scooter, please post the link under this video or notify us so that it's easier to get the parts for them. But I have seen on eBay the complete recoil assembly and a complete carburetor as well. They are easily available on there. Another question I often get is why doesn't my mower have any spark? It does have a good ignition module and a brand new spark plug and they're wondering what's going on. 
If your lawnmower has a lever like this, which is like a safety lever and a cable attached to it that goes to the motor. Right over here, as you can see. So when I bring the lever down, you can see it move at the motor. Well, what happens sometimes is that the cable may become damaged and this part here will not retract far enough to allow your engine to have spark. Sometimes people leave their lawnmowers outside or even if they're inside, the cables get damaged or frayed inside or they get twisted or if somebody bends the cable, it leaves a kink in it and then the cable doesn't work as good as it should. Therefore, not allowing that part on the motor I just showed you to retract properly. And if it doesn't retract properly, you're not going to have spark and your lawnmower will not start. And the easy fix for that is just by replacing the cable. I just posted a video not long ago showing how to replace a brake cable on a lawnmower with a Tecumseh engine. It will be similar on any other engine on your lawnmower. So what I'll do is I'll post a link to that video underneath this video for today and you guys can go watch that. You'll see in the video it's very easy to replace the cable and it can resolve all your problems. And depending on the lawnmower you have, the cable can cost between $10 to $25. So it's not a big expense to get it running properly again. Another question I often get is people ask me, does my lawnmower have points in it? Well, if your lawnmower is 20 years or newer, it more than likely does not have points. Points and condensers have not been used in small engines for quite a while. But if you have an old lawnmower like this one with an engine like this, it does have points in it. This is an older Briggs & Stratton 3.5 engine with points and condenser. So even though your older engine may have points and a condenser, it will still have an ignition module. On the newer mowers without points and a condenser, all you're going to have is an ignition module. I find it's a lot easier to diagnose no spark issues with engines without points and a condenser. The other day a YouTuber sent me an email telling me that his tractor will not move, even if he puts it in neutral. Now assuming that you don't have a problem inside your transmission, I'm going to show you today another problem that pops up that stops the wheels from turning on a lawn tractor. What happens sometimes is the brakes get jammed on your lawn tractor. The brake pads will get jammed on the small rotor for the brakes and it stops the wheels from turning. So here's the brake rotor on my lawn tractor. You can see it's nice and loose. You can see the brake pads up in here. And I've seen often tractors where this rotor will not move at all. It will not even have this small play here that you can see. And the cause of that is that the brake pads are just jammed in there, stopping everything from turning. Now depending on your tractor, you may have a half inch nut over here that you can loosen to get the brake pads to let go of the rotor. On this one it's a bit different but it's the same principle. Always check this first before doing any major repairs on your transmission because all it could be is just that the rotor is jammed in the brake pads. In my next question today sometimes people ask me if they can use this yellow Tigon on lawnmowers. Well the answer to that is yes you can use Tigon on your lawnmower but I prefer using the black line like the one that comes on the engine when you first buy it. Look on this one more here, you can see the black fuel line. I find that this fuel line here stays much tighter for much longer. Now the Tigon is good fuel line too as well, but I just find that the black stuff is just much better on four cycle engines like this. But that's my preference. Again, the Tigon is excellent fuel line. It's really good and durable. But for certain applications, I just prefer using the black stuff. My last question today is from another YouTuber who is also a small engine mechanic. And his question is, how do you tell people when they bring stuff to be repaired that it's not worth fixing? Well, first of all, you have to be tactful when you tell people this and you have to explain to them how much it's going to cost and what a new one would cost. I always base it on what a replacement unit would cost. And then I give them an estimate. It's not written in stone because you can always run into other snags. And then I let them decide what they want me to do. But I do tell them that if I have to spend an hour on it, that I still have to charge them a little bit for it even if the unit ends up being garbage. Because you don't want to spend your whole day looking at junk for free and not making any money as well. That's not good either. So to give you an idea, here's a blower which is not worth much. It's probably under $100 to replace it. Now the pull cord, there's something wrong with it. It doesn't retract. The unit does not run properly to start with. So who knows what's wrong with that. If you even put a carb kit in there, it's 20 bucks plus a bit of labor. It adds up and these are not the easiest things to take apart to even fix a recoil. 
So to me, this thing isn't worth fixing because it would cost more than half of what a new one's worth. The customer told me I don't want to spend more than 40 bucks on it, so I just kind of went from there, and I know that I cannot fix this for 40 bucks. So I'm just going to call them and tell them it's not worth fixing. Unless the guy says it doesn't matter what it costs, but then I don't like to overcharge people either to fix stuff that's not worth it. But I always tell my customers up front so that they don't get a surprise or I phone them to let them know what's going on. And then I ask them, do you want me to repair it even if it costs X number of dollars or not? And usually if you give them an estimate and you tell them the cost of a new one, they can make up their minds pretty quick. Unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of things are disposable and they are not worth fixing. So that'll be it for this week's Q&A. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you again in two weeks. Have a great weekend.